Hello everyone, Dr. Lonely here. This is a video for Friday. It's to cover a lot, frankly, of book four and at least the first half of book five. My plan is to go up to the beginning of the narrative of the war in heaven, but I'm going to save <clears throat> the war in heaven, the, um, the rebellion of Satan and the ensuing war. I'm going to save that for next Monday. So let's begin, if we could, in book four on page 134. This is when Satan, having landed on earth, leapt over the wall, now comes in disguise. So he's, he's a cormorant. Um, as this bird, he looks down from a tree and sees Adam and Eve first. Line 288. Two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike erect, with native honor clad, in naked majesty seemed lords of all, and worthy seemed, for in their looks divine the image of their glorious maker shone, truth, wisdom, sanctitude, severe and pure, severe, but in true filial freedom placed, whence true authority in men, though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed, for contemplation he and valor formed, for softness she and sweet attractive grace. He for God only, she for God in him. His fair large front and eye sublime declared absolute rule, and hyacinthine locks round from his parted forelock manly hung clustering, but not beneath his shoulders broad. She, as a veil down to the slender waist, her unadorned golden tresses wore, disheveled, but in wanton ringlets waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection, but required with gentle sway, and by her yielded, by him best received, yielded with coy submission, modest pride, and sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. Okay, I'll stop it there before we get any more embarrassed. <clears throat> what is important here? Okay, first of all, there are erect, we recall perhaps Aristotle's definition of mankind as an upright, featherless biped. <laughs> um, they're the animals that walk upright. There's a kind of, there's something different about them that their their minds are up, up in the, in the air, perhaps more than, more than others symbolically. They have the image of their maker. Um, though they're not equal, 295, and here's where it gets interesting. They're not e equal as their sex not equal seemed, which is to say appearances suggest inequality. They don't look the same, obviously. For contemplation he and valor formed, he's a thinker, he's an intellectual. For softness she and sweet attractive grace. <laughs> He for God only, she for God in him. These are some of the most potentially, and I think legitimately, offensive parts of Paradise Lost. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about other things in days to come. But this is, frankly, a kind of sub-biblical conception of what a woman is, I think we can say. Um, especially the, this idea of he for God only, right? There's a direct line between him and God, Adam and God. She for God in him. She only gets God in a mediated way through the husband, right? No direct connection there. It's hard for me not to read this and think that it's a, a violation of Paul's lines in Galatians chapter 3 and elsewhere, he says the same thing. Uh, he says, all are one in Christ Jesus, or sorry, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So there's this kind of leveling of the, of not the playing field, but this leveling effect across the traditional categories that separate and define human beings 
racial, ethnic, cultural, class, um, but also uh, the sexual boundary. <clears throat> so there in Paul, it looks like men and women are equally standing before God, right? Not that they're, you know, radically the same or something, but that there's a certain equality before God, which matters. And I would say it cuts very much against the grain of the vision of the ancient, uh, the ancient world, both of, you know, racial, ethnic, tribal distinctions, but also of the sexual distinction. You know, women are nothing if not second-class citizens or third in most ancient cultures. Um, and a big part of the biblical revolution that defines Christianity, a big part, like it's a, it's a major theme and strain, is the elevation of women to equality, um, equality before God, which gives them a kind of dignity unimagined in other world cultures. Okay, so what I'm trying to get around to is that I think it's reasonable to say Milton devalues or kind of walks back um, some of the um, hard-won equality of women that, that I think biblical revelation accomplishes. I mean, put it this way. In, in Dante's Divine Comedy, you have a character like Beatrice, Beatrice, who is very much Dante's equal, if not his intellectual superior in that poem, um, and teaches him, right? <laughs> uh, and, and so on and so forth. Like that, that kind of relationship is not really, that's not only not here in Milton, he seems actually to be pushing back against that. So I just wanted to register that, that, uh, that that's, that thought is there. Um, if you felt like this was a kind of slighting depiction of women, I mean, I personally would agree. Now, let me also say, I am not the kind of guy who wants to slam the door on Milton now that we've found he has um, a limited and too limiting view of women. He still has something to say, okay? And I think even about women, he has truth to tell. So the way I think we need to think about this, it's the way that I think we need to think about everyone that we disagree with. And this is for all of you, even those of you who may agree with Milton more. I, I have no idea. Um, the way I think to, to encounter people with whom we might have some disagreement is this. We want to appreciate their vision of the world from the inside. What does Milton see? What is he trying to show us and direct our attention to? What is he sensitive to? in reality. <clears throat> um, first try to see it from within that world, which he's kind of creating for us in this book. First try to see it on its own terms. Then, once you think you've appreciated that and seen what he has given you to see, of course we can step back and say, now what do I think about that? Well, I think there's a problem here and here and here. I wouldn't go that far. I would have gone further here. I like this. I don't like that. You can make all the distinctions you want, of course. But first, appreciate what this person sees. So we're going to try to be, uh, to be and to remain sensitive to, to what Milton sees here. I think there's going to be much more to say about men and women, male, female roles, Adam and Eve, before this is over. And it's not all going to be bad, actually. So just a little footnote there. Okay, so we've got the relation of the sexes front and center unequal. Okay. Um, now, what happens here? Like, their description starts to make us uncomfortable. We get all of the uh, hyacinthine locks and the parted forelock, manly hung clustering and all of this. It's like he's talking about hair and yet it feels like strangely transgressive, the descriptions here. You get her unadorned golden tresses, her wanton ringlets, uh, waving in tendrils and implying subjection, but require, required with gentle sway. 
and yielded with coy submission and modest pride. And we haven't even gotten to like the, the uh, mysterious parts that are then concealed and all of this. Milton is really making us feel their nakedness. <laughs> this is a highly sensuous picture of Adam and Eve. Why? I think he wants us to feel the difference between their naked majesty and purity and our own fallen um, our, our own fallenness, right? Which is a barrier between us and them. Um, just to support that suggestion, um, look a bit further. The mysterious parts are not concealed. There was no guilty shame then, line 313. Um, no dishonest shame of nature's works. Sin bred. Um, how have ye troubled all mankind? Okay, so they were different then. And he, he really doesn't stop at any, um, at any opportunity to make us feel their nakedness. He keeps on mentioning, oh, by the way, did I tell you they're naked? And you know, Eve will be serving food later. She's naked. Did I tell you she's na naked? She's naked. Yeah, everything's naked. Naked, naked, naked. <laughs> so this is part of the drama, I would suggest, that I mentioned earlier. Drawn to Satan, off put by God, um, feeling the... You know, feeling the our own disordered relation to unfallen Adam and Eve. I think this is all part of the reader's drama here. Now, next thing. Um, skip forward to their first speeches. Um, 138, 139. Adam's first speech to Eve, that we hear anyway. starts 411 soul partner and soul part of all these joys dearer thyself than all needs must the power that made us and for us this ample world be infinitely good and of his good as liberal and free as infinite that raised us from the dust and placed us here in all this happiness who at his hand have nothing merited nor can perf perform aught whereof he hath need he who requires from us no other service than to keep this one, this easy charge, of all the trees in paradise that bear delicious fruit so various, not to taste that, on, that only tree of knowledge, planted by the tree of life. So near grows death to life, whate'er death is, some dreadful thing, no doubt. For well thou knowest, God hath pronounced it death to taste that tree, the only sign of our obedience left, among so many signs of power and rule, conferred upon us, and dominion given over all other creatures that possess earth, air, and sea. Then let us not think hard one easy prohibition, who enjoy free leave so large to all things else, and choice unlimited of man full of delights. But let us ever praise him and extol his bounty, following our delightful task to prune these growing plants, plants and tend these flowers, which were to toilsome, yet with thee were sweet. Okay, what's interesting about all this? <laughs> He, he goes on and on about what they're not allowed to do. It's kind of strange. He says, the power that made us, 412, must be good. He's given us all of this, raised us up into a place of happiness. We haven't merited any of this. And the only service he asks is that we keep this garden and don't taste of that tree. That's our only sign of obedience left among so many signs of power and rule. Um, we shouldn't think it's hard to, that we only have that one easy prohibition. That's the only thing. It's just that one thing, and it's not a big deal after all. I tell, like We have this great situation. There's only that one thing. He just keeps on <laughs> insisting on this thing that they shouldn't think about, but you know how it is. If you say, if you keep on saying the one thing that you shouldn't think about, it's hard not to keep thinking about it, think about it even more. Um, so he's enacting that forbidden fruit syndrome, which is so natural to humans. Um, he seems to be fixated on what he can't have, on the one thing that's denied him. The question we have to ask about this 
is parallel to our question which we must have about Eve. Eve, who is on the next page being compared to Narcissus, right? She wakes up and is drawn to herself in the pool, or in, in the water. Doesn't even want to turn to Adam from it. Why is Adam fixated on the forbidden fruit already? Unfallen Adam. Why is Eve drawn narcissistically to her own image? Unfallen. What on earth does that even mean? Um, <laughs> Milton's not dumb. He's doing this on purpose. Why? What, what is he showing us by having them unfallen yet associate, like doing things that we would associate with fallenness? I want to talk about this more with you in person, but let me suggest one possible partial explanation. Milton wants to separate um, wants to separate their nature, okay, and their habits and their, their kind of uh, inclinations. He wants to separate those from sin itself. Um, another way of putting it, I think he wants to I think he wants to follow what we could call a law-based, um, understanding of sin rather than a natural law understanding of sin. If sin is a matter of following or, or rather breaking the law, then it's a matter of, of um, going against the commandment. God says don't eat of the tree. Sin is eating of the tree. It's breaking that one commandment. That's all sin is. It's a matter of it's a matter of not doing or refusing to do the one thing asked of you. It's, it's kind of, it's legal definition. We are used, and the tradition tends to um, define sin, yes, in terms of the law, but also in terms of nature, which means, you know, we, there's the traditionally a doctrine of the Garden of Eden as a place of perfection of nature, where you have no evil inclinations. Um, you're not, you don't have any of what the later tradition will call concupiscence, which means these kind of natural tendencies towards fallen things or, or towards illicit desires. You know, natural tendencies towards gluttony or lust or, or so, what's, what have you. Milton, as it were, gives Adam and Eve a little concupiscence, but nevertheless calls them unfallen to show us that concupiscence, the vicissitudes of nature and this and that, like little movements of habits and uh, potencies and, and possibilities and things, those are not sin. So I think he has a reason for wanting to separate nature and law there. I just wanted to flag it for you because he, he's wanting us to be attentive to it. He's trying to surprise us into noticing that, I think. All right, let's go a little further. We'll talk more about Adam and Eve later. The end of book four, page 153, we see Satan in the form of a toad, or at least he's squat like a toad, line 800, close at the ear of Eve, assaying by his devilish art to reach the organs of her fancy, and with them forge illusions as he lists, phantasms and dreams. So he's whispering little dreams into her into her fan, her fancy her imagination and as we open and you know gabriel comes in and hey what are you doing get out of here and they throw him back out um never come here again of course it's going to be very easy for him to break back in but but okay let's look at the beginning of book five now where we actually hear about her dream she and adam wake up the next morning page 163 um, she gives him a hug, 27. Oh, Adam, so glad to see you. You'll never know. You'll never guess what happened to me last night. 35. Me thought close at mine ear. One called me forth to walk with gentle voice. And I thought it was you. It said, this voice, right, in her dream, says, Why sleepst thou, Eve? Now is the pleasant time, the cool, the silent, save where silence yields to the night-warbling bird that now awake tunes sweetest his love-labored song. Now reigns full-orbed the moon, 
and with more pleasing light shadowy sets off the face of things. In vain, if none regard. Heaven wakes with all his eyes, whom to behold but thee. Nature's desire, in whose sight all things joy with ravishment, attracted by thy beauty still to gaze. Baby, wake up. The whole world is looking at you. The whole nighttime. Everything is right around you. It's all focused around you. Remember the drawings I've drawn up on the board. <laughs> to fall is to fall into a self-centered vision of the world. Uh, an egocentric conception. This is part and parcel of Satan's pre-temptation, because that's what this is, right? Again, this is an extra biblical detail, and we can ask and should ask, why is Milton putting in a temptation before the temptation? Um, I'm going to postpone that question for now. Just to notice this, the structure of this. Heaven is awake for you. Everything is looking at you because you're the most beautiful thing ever. Um, notice how he says, um, you know, why are you, why despise the knowledge that comes from this fruit? Line 60. Um, he's talking to the forbidden fruit. He's trying to arouse that desire in her as well. Um, top of the next page, 69. It's forbidden here as only fit for gods, lowercase g gods, introducing that pagan framework to, to Eve for gods yet able to make gods of men, right? And then he says, 77, taste this and be henceforth among the gods, thyself a goddess. Okay, so he's preparing the ground for the temptation to, uh, the temptation to, um, you know, godlike, small g, godlike egocentrism, which, um, we've already seen as part of the fall. And he carries up her, carries her up into the sky to see herself, see the earth from below. Again, a godlike kind of view. Okay, she wakes up. Ah, that was a scary dream, wasn't it? Notice Adam's response. Best image of myself and dearer half, 95. The trouble of thy thoughts this night in sleep affects me equally. Hey, babe, I feel your pain. He's saying. Um, 100. Wait, hold on. 99. Yet evil, whence? In thee can harbor none, created pure. There can't be any evil in you. Where did this come from? But now, but know that in the soul are many lesser faculties that serve reason as chief. Among these, fancy next her office holds of all external things, which of the five watchful senses represent she forms imaginations, airy shapes, which reason joining or disjoining frames all what we affirm or what deny, and call our knowledge or opinion, then retires into her private cell with nature rests, or when nature rests, oft in her absence mimic fancy wakes to imitate her, thus but misjoining shapes wild work produces oft and most in dreams, ill matching words and deeds long past or late. Okay, so he's saying you have the imagination which takes data from the senses um, and, and can you imagine pictures of the world. The reason can correct it, but not so much when you're asleep, right? And so your fancy can go wild and come up with crazy things uh, without being that, that your reason needs to talk back to. So you had these, this crazy dream. That doesn't mean it's real. Uh, and we just got to talk back to it. Now, look, all of that sounds good, and it's all actually from classical psychology. It's all kind of Aristotle's psychology. And it's all fine. It just feels a little like mansplaining here. Why? Well, one, remember Adam's an intellectual, right? Um, he is a thinker, and and uh, so he immediately takes this dream of diabolical temptation from beyond the world, and who knows how this even got here this demonic, uh, unimaginable egocent like fall into egocentrism, into pride. He takes that and says, well, look, honey, it's just, uh, it's just a matter of like getting your internal faculties in order, which it kind of is actually, it's not untrue, but that's a simplification of what actually happened. 
Now, this is what mansplaining is, right? Mansplaining is like, here, just put this little framework on it, and that will make the problem go away. We don't have to take it. We don't have to take it seriously further than that. Um, all I'm saying is Adam is kind of by nature a little bit of a rationalist. It's not entirely bad. Everything he says is true, but um, there's more there than he is attending to, and they actually are in danger. Okay, she her feeling is real there. The, the, her response and fear is keyed to something real in the world. Okay, so now, next thing that happens, um, we, we scoot up to heaven and we hear God, the Father, who's now concerned because Satan has broken in, he's, he wants to send an angel to give them a warning. And we hear him at the bottom of page 169, calling to himself Raphael, the sociable spirit. I'm going to say Raphael, even though some of you might be used to saying Raphael, right, in, the, in a good Italian or Spanish way, because uh, Raphael is traditionally how the British would say it, and it seems to be how Milton, um, Milton said it. So Raphael, the sociable spirit, that deigned to travel with Tobias. So, so uh, Raphael, the sociable spirit, Raphael from the start is tagged as a, he, as a talker. He's got the gift of the gab. He likes to socialize, right? Um, and indeed, he's going to talk a lot. Line, next page, look at Raphael's marching orders from the father. He says, it starts at line 224, but let's pick it up at 229. Go therefore, says the father, Half this day, as friend with friend, converse with Adam, in what bower or shade thou findst him from the heat of noon retired, to respite his day labor with repast, or with repose, and such discourse bring on, as may advise him of his happy state, happiness in his power left free to will, left to his own free will, his will though free, yet mutable, whence warn him to beware, he swerve not too secure. Tell him withal his danger, and from whom, and what enemy late befallen, Late fallen himself from heaven is plotting now the fall of others from like state bliss. By violence? No, for that shall be withstood. But by deceit and lies, this let him know, lest willfully transgressing he pretend surprisal, unadmonished, unforewarned. Okay. A bit there at the end, um, lest he, you know, lest he pretend surprisal, uh, lest he say that we didn't warn him, we need to warn him. A little bit of that, a little bit more of that defensiveness we've heard from the father back from in book three. But I'm not going to comment on that. I want to just mainly say, what are the what are the directions he gets? Converse with Adam about whatever comes up, and in the context of that conversation, you know, friend with friend. In the context of that conversation, um, warn him of his danger, and how. Tell, remind him to be on his guard. He is strong enough to to, uh, to resist. Okay, so he's got a pretty broad compass within which to act, Raphael does. Um, good. We'll come back to that. He comes down. There's this majestic description of him, him flying down to, to earth. Adam sees him. One of my favorite lines, 298. He sees him coming from afar. Him through the spicy forest onward come, Adam discerned. I love that they call Eden a spicy forest. I don't know why. It's just something about that. Okay, comes along, and Adam's like, whoa. You know, there's, there's a nice picture of this next page. Now, I want to skip forward to the, some of the think, conversations that they have in the opening pages of Raphael's visit. Um, hmm. So they're eating food. Eve is serving some food. Um, and Adam asks Raphael an intellectual question. He's going to ask him question after question of various kinds, um, all sort of the kinds of questions that thinkers raise, right? Things that are interesting to people who think about things like Adam. For example, hey, we're eating food. Do angels, like, do you guys do the same thing with food that we do? Is that, like, how does angelic biology work? 
you know, digestive systems and things like this. He's asking this at 397 and following. Um, let's see. This might be unsavory food to spiritual natures, but I wouldn't know because I don't know much about angels. Can you tell me? The angel says, um, the angel starts to explain the difference between human and angelic natures. They're, they're basically doing natural philosophy of a kind. Um, and so that's interesting and all, but like all, all extra biblical, these are things that, that Milton adds in. You're be thinking like, what's happening with these different conversations that they have? Why are these here? Um, one of the things so he basically says, I can eat your food, right? <laughs> I can like, uh, it doesn't work exactly the same with us angels. And yet, um, we can still do this. Adam, skip to the end, 179, page line 451. When they finished eating, sudden mind arose in Adam, not to let the occasion pass, given him by, his, by this great conference, to know of things above his world, and of their being who dwell in heaven, whose excellence he saw transcend his own so far, whose radiant forms div divine effulgence, whose high power so far exceeded human, and his wary speech, Thus to the imperial minister he framed. So he's going to take this opportunity to ask some questions about things that transcend his experience. Um, okay, and he's asking more about more follow-up questions about food and like that angelic natures and everything. Listen to this, 468 at the bottom. Actually, top of 180. O oh, Adam, one almighty is from whom all things proceed, and up to him return, if not depraved from good, created all such to perfection. One first matter all, endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and in things that live of life, but more refined, more spiritous and pure, as nearer to him placed, or nearer tending, each in their several active spheres assigned, till body up to spirit work, in bounds proportion to each kind. So from the root springs lighter the green stalk, and from thence the leaves more airy, last the bright consummate flower, spirits odorous breathe, flowers and their fruit man's nourishment, by gradual scale sublimed to vital spirits aspire, to animal, to intellectual, give both life and sense, fancy and understanding, whence the soul reason receives, and the reason is her being, discursive or intuitive. Okay. Part of what's happening here is everything is made out of the same matter. One matter all, one first matter all, endued with various forms, various degrees of substance. So you've got this sliding scale of matter. This is going to be a little alien to your way of thinking, probably. Where at the bottom end of the scale, you have the most kind of clunky, uh, materially dense um, objects, like stones, dirt, maybe. Then you got plants, uh, then you got animals, then you have intellectual animals, right, like humans, then you have angel angels, and then you've got God at the top. So it's like a sliding spirit from a, slide, a sliding scale from most material to most spiritual. Let's not put God on the scale, actually, he's not really mentioned. But um, all created things are actually made out of the same stuff. The angels, on this account, made out of the same stuff, but their matter is more spiritual, which is to say, this is something like, it's more rarefied. It's more like a gas where uh, it's still composed of particles, but there's a lot of air between the particles. They, they can be compressed and expanded, gases, um, and, and they, they're just... Uh, they're much more malleable and full of space um, and less dense, okay? And, and so there's this kind of sliding scale of being, as we, as we say. And you can kind of move up that, that scale with your mind, um, but you also have a place on that scale, right, as, as a human being. And uh, this is all interesting. It's going to be relevant. One of the one of the payoffs of this is you can see if angels are kind of like um, spiritual matter, so to speak. This partially explains why they they, they sort of behave like gaseous su <laughs> substances, where 
they can compress down into the little things or they can expand at will, right? Um, they have control over their volume um, because, uh, because of what they are, right? Uh, unlike <laughs> rocks and things. Anyway, this is, if this seems re uh, irrelevant, I don't think it will be. I think it will become more important later. Because, I mean, at the very least, he's talking on the next page about how, hey, look, you could gradually um, move up the scale and become more like angels, right? You could, improved by tract of time, 498, winged, ascend, ethereal, as we, and it maybe end up um, in heaven. Um, but, he says, meanwhile, 503, enjoy your fill, what happiness this happy state can comprehend, incapable of more. Okay, but he adds at the end, remember, you're created for this place. So this is, like, this starts to get interesting with Gabe, with Rachel. He's talking about things above Adam's ken, above his place, and, and Adam's very interested. He's continually drawn up to those places, those high, heavenly thoughts, these higher thoughts, uh, philosophically, but also in terms of uh, theology and, and, um, and imagination. He's very much drawn up there to those higher things. And Raphael's leading him there, but he's also giving him warnings. Hey, remember, remember your place. You're actually incapable of going up there in, in a certain way. Good. And Adam keeps on asking more questions. This is where I'm going to end for today. He asks him about, um, let's see. Well, so Raphael, at the bottom of 181, gives him the warning that God told him to give him. Son of heaven, 519, son of heaven and earth, attend. That thou art happy, O to God. Um, that thou continuest such, O to thyself. This is to, this is to thy obedience. Therein stand. Stand in your obedience and don't give in to any temptation. And Adam's like, speaking of temptation, how is that like? How is that imaginable? What is that? What is evil? <laughs> Can we talk about how that began? So he's really asking about the the, the fall of Satan and the, and the war in heaven, which comes from that. Um, but he, even though he doesn't know that history yet, and Raphael's going to tell him. But look at top of one eighty three. This is my last point. Raphael says, "High matter thou enjoins to me, O prime of men." Sad task and hard, for how shall I relate to human sense the invisible exploits of warring spirits? How without remorse the ruin of so many glorious once and perfect while they stood? How last unfold the secrets of another world, perhaps not lawful to reveal? Yet for thy good this is dispensed, and what surmounts the reach of human sense I shall delineate so, by likening spiritual to corporal forms as may express them best. Though what if earth be but the shadow of heaven, and things therein each to other like, more than on earth is thought. Okay, so what is he doing? He's, he first says, sure, I'll tell you. Even though I'm not sure how it's going to work exactly, how will I tell you, the, how can I narrate the warfare of invisible spirits, the invisible exploits of warring spirits? Um, how is it possible? Is it even quite lawful, he asks, which is interesting. Yet for thy good, this is dispensed. I'm going to tell it to you for your good, even though I'm not sure if you can understand this, uh, or this, is this the right thing to do? Nevertheless, likening spiritual to corporal forms, I will tell, I'll tell you a, a just-so story that can help you understand it. Um, in your own way. So he is very much flagging or putting an asterisk beside the story he's about to tell about Satan's fall and the war that follows and everything. Um, what is the asterisk? The asterisk is saying this looks like your world, but it's not your world. This is things are not as they seem exactly, right? There is an appearance reality divide here between the appearance of my story and then the reality that it's narrating. So you need to be careful in thinking about it to keep that in mind. Remember the kind of knowledge you're being given. Um, for your good, I'm going to give it to you. But there's a kind of skittishness there 
in Raphael's presentation, in his introduction of this material, which we just need to keep in mind. And, and so on Monday, we'll discuss the content of his narrative and figure out what we think about that first fall and um, how it's going to matter in Milton's story. So I'll discuss with you the rest of book five and book six then. Have a good weekend.